the worship song books tonight. Page number 48. Sorry, kids. Kneel at the cross. Page number 48. And your brethren, we have met to worship song books. Page number 48. Page number 48. Page number 48. Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. Come on, He waits for you. Turning to page number 27, let's take care of some announcements. Remind you of August the 30th at 5 o'clock will be family game night here at the church. But tonight, right after church, men's group, all men that wants to, that can sing, and those who cannot sing. That's the only one I know of, right? No, but anyway, uh, Brother Dave is going to meet quickly after church tonight. And those that would like to sing in a men's group, why please meet with him. And right after church. All right, tonight? All right, let's go to page number 27. He abides. I'm rejoicing night and day. Number 27. Page number 27. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the pilgrim way. For the hand of God in all my life I see. And the reason of my bliss, yes, the secret all it is. That the comforter abides with me. He abides, he abides. Hallelujah, he abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way. For the comforter abides with me. Once my heart 
promise we have. Amen. Amen. Brother Danny Douglas, would you open our service in prayer tonight, please? Page number 73 tonight. Page number 73. Page number 73 tonight. He's the lily of the valley. Page number 73. Page number 73 in your song books tonight. Page number 73. Jesus, he's everything to me. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow, he's my comfort. In trouble, he's my stay. He tells me all care to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest. And all my idols, from my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. 
Hallelujah. You just need to get just a little louder over here, okay? Just a little bit, huh? Pastor, come on. Tonight to Colossians chapter 3. Good singing tonight, wasn't it? Boy, Deb, bless your heart. Strengthen your soul and your spirit. Colossians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to preach uh, hopefully a pastoral type message tonight and just graze through the Word of God. Colossians chapter 3, the epistle to the church at Coloss that the Holy Ghost sent through Paul. And last Sunday night, we preached a wonderful 15-minute message. I'm not going to bite the bait. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3. Now, uh, we left off last week uh, with verse 18 and 19. It's actually what we kind of preached on there for a little bit. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And we looked at that last Sunday night. <clears throat> so we're going to kind of hit on this now. Verse number 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And um, one of the great things that a child can learn is attentiveness to their parents, number one. Secondly, obedience to their parents. It's hard to obey if you're not attentive. And uh, I would encourage you to teach your children how to pay attention. Pay attention. Be alert. Uh, it might be a case of life and death, depending on how well you've taught your child to pay attention. And uh, how well you've taught them to listen and respond. Uh, get away. Or run. I mean, you know, if they just look at you like, well, I don't have to mind you. Obedience in children is a wonderful thing, a good thing. It's for our good, for our protection. And um, and we're so, well, many of us, like myself, probably so sorry and low down. I did not o willingly obey my mom and dad, but I did learn to obey after a while. <clears throat> so... And I'm glad that I had a mom and daddy that taught me to obey, whether I understood it or not. And uh, you cannot have peace and tranquility in your home with disrespectful, rebellious, uh, cocky children. And you want to teach your children to obey. And I'll tell you, there and anywhere else you may be. Here at church, uh, you teach your children not to run in church. You teach your children that uh, there's a place to play and there's a place not to play. Yes. And a time to play and a time not to play. And that's not being mean to nobody. The one, in fact, one of the major problems with America is that Dr. Spock was believed over the Bible. Yeah. And uh, it got us in trouble. Yeah. And it'll do you well. And you, if you're here to, to see that you're a child, you should be thankful to God that you have mom and dad that teaches you to obey yeah. uh, in the Lord. But I want to move on past that tonight to verse 22, and we're going to read two passages of Scripture. In verse 22 of chapter 3 of Colossians, I want to talk tonight about labor. I want to talk about working employees and employee relationships from a scriptural standpoint. These are things you've got to deal with every day of your life. They're important to all of us. And as I said, this is a feeding message for us to know uh, wisdom and have truth and wisdom from God's Word, not somebody's opinion. I don't have the answer to these questions, but the Bible does. And all of us are going to have to deal with this one way or another. We're all under some type of authority. And it's unlikely that you'll get through life without having to work for somebody. And uh, God's got wisdom in this. And I, I love and appreciate this passage of Scripture. Verse number 22, servants. Uh, 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 verse 21, I'm not going to preach on those two verses. Children talks about fathers provoke not your children to anger. That is a very powerful passage of Scripture. But not going to preach on that at this time. But it's possible to provoke your children to anger, and you don't even realize you're doing it. You're, you're so occupied, preoccupied, you don't realize you're doing it. But um, children ought to be encouraged, not discouraged by their fathers. If you get to your, children, get your, your son gets to where he cannot please you, there's nothing he can do right. You're going to get a discouraged boy, and it's going to be a problem to deal with down the, down the road. A lot of things to that. I, for whatever reason, I just feel like the Lord would have me to go on to verse number 22. Through four one, 
It says, Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it hardly as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Amen. 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 Chapter 4, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye have a master in heaven. <clears throat> Let's turn back to Ephesians chapter 6, and you're going to see the companion scripture to this in the epistle of Ep Paul wrote to Ephesus there. In chapter 6, you'll see the companion sister passage of scripture here. In uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 5. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ. This passage of scripture are almost identical. Not with eye service as, men's ple as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good anything doeth, any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And you masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him. When the Apostle Paul wrote this, and the Bible is written about this, written in the middle of a civilization that had everything from indentured service to slavery, to employees and all kinds of situations. The Word of God is capable of addressing any situation in life that you're in. <clears throat> uh, labor relations has affected American history immensely. This issue about people, it has affected the world, world history. The whole concept of Marxism and Leninism is about this issue right here. And it's important as Christians, first of all, and then as Americans, second of all, that we understand biblical labor relations. Now, we live in a country that, thank God, there's not slavery, or at least I hope there's, there may be in some situation, but it's not illegal. It, but it's not legal. But we do live in a country where you can be an employer and an employee. And in this situation here of masters and servants, you might say, well, it's the guy's an employee and an employer. Okay, that's the application to you and I here. Um, so we're going to look at these things and, and go down through and then I'll hit a few other things. And I want you to key in on this because these are things you can take home with you that you're going to have to deal with every day of your life. And we'll talk about Marxism a little bit later on and about uh, socialism and the things that America is facing right now, even in this current election. But it said there, the father uh, prayed to see him to help me to rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, not just write and divide it, but help us apply it as we leave this place, whether we're working for somebody or, Lord, whether people are working for us. God, help us to be biblical and not social nonsense and not fleshly, but God, help us to do right according to the Word of God in these areas of our life, irregardless of where we may find our station to be. Lord, I pray tonight that you'll give us biblical wisdom as we look at the various philosophies concerning labor and concerning employment and, and monetary issues and wealth issues and so forth. God, help us to be biblical in this matter. And I thank you, God, for the freedom we have in America, that we're not a communist nation yet. And I pray that we'll never be. I pray, God, that you would strike down this giant of socialism that's approaching us and cast in a shadow over the opportunities of our children. God, keep us from this evil, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. It says there in verse number 22, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. You know, when I have worked for other people and they, and I, I don't, I'm not, 
I, I have people work for me once in a while and, and some, and I have a tendency to not command somebody to do anything. I have a tendency to say, would you care to go over and do that? I don't like to have a big bossy attitude toward people that work on me because the Bible said, let him the chief among you be servant of all. So if you're the boss, you really ought to be servant to the people that's employed by you. You ought to take in consideration their lives, their families, their marriages, their home, their children, their livelihood. You ought to care for the people that work for you as you'd want people to care for you. And you ought to take a lot more into consideration other than just singly a prophet. There's nothing wrong with prophet. It's a wonderful, beautiful word. It's a wonderful, beautiful concept. I despise people who hate the word prophet. Those are usually communists and socialists. And they usually live in a country that you don't, you can't even buy bread. But it says obey. Now, when, if I'm going to work for a guy and he asks me to go, or he tells me to go do something, God expects us to do that. He don't expect you to buck up and say, I'm not doing that. You don't tell me what to do. That's, that's not biblical. If you're unable to obey the person you're working for, you probably ought not be wor working for them. Y'all just say, you know what, I, I just can't work here. I can't work under this. <clears throat> now, uh, we're going to get into different things here. He said, according to the flesh. Now, here's an important, 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 important phrase. Not with eye service. One of the main things that God tells us as Christians to do is to work for people, when we're working for people, to not work only if they're looking and watching us. But to work unto the Lord if they never saw us. To be the same person whether the boss is on the job or not on the job. To do the same kind of job we'd do if he's there or not there. How many say amen right there? Amen. That's Christianity at work. That's Christianity in practice. In fact, it goes further and says, not with eye service. In other words, I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do if you're watching. But if you're not watching, I'm going to drop the ball. As men pleasers, not as men pleasers. This is one of the most liberating, freeing truths about this issue that you'll ever get hold of. If you can work not in eye service of men and men pleasers, but as unto the Lord. When you go on that job, you get in your brain and in your heart that ultimately I am working for God, not that person. But I'm going to honor God as a Christian when I'm working for that person. And I'm not just going to be an eye service guy that's, you know, working whenever he can see me and trying to impress him and be deceitful. And I'm not going to do it just to please him. My ultimate goal is to please the Lord. Amen. And if we'll do that, that's the most, most liberating thing. Because that takes care of bad bosses and contrary bosses. I'm, my ultimate work is not for you. It's for the Lord. And because it's for the Lord, yeah, I'm going to suffer some things maybe I wouldn't like. But I'm going to do it. He said, as many, but singleness of heart. Singleness means that you be single. The talk, Bible talks about single-eyed. You're not dualistic in what you're doing. One person this day and one person next day in different alternative motives. You're just working with singleness of heart. We're here to get this job done. I've been hired to do this. I'm going to do it the best ability I can. But I'm not going to be focused. My whole working work ethic is going to rise above men to the Lord. And I'm going to work as unto the Lord on my job and not unto men. This, to me, is probably one of the most effective ways that you can be a witness in your daily practical life. That you could possibly have. Because if you say you're a Christian. And you pull this eye service business. And this men pleasers business. You will ruin your testimony. And you will blaspheme the name of Christ. He's, he says he's a Christian. Goes to church every Sunday over at Liberty Faith. Be lazy as a hound dog. And it won't work. If I, if I go off the job. He drops his tools. That doesn't come across as very Christian to, to a lost man. Amen. Now. He said, fearing God. So we're working as unto the Lord in singleness of heart, in fearing God, that we're ultimately not just giving account to this employer, but we're giving account to God Almighty. Then he says in verse number 23, he says, that whatsoever you do, do it with the least amount of effort you can possibly do. Hardly. Put your heart into it. Now, you know something? 
If you're working day after day after day and sometimes it gets monotonous and so forth, it kind of gets hard to put your heart into it. Yeah. Let me say further, if your work is not appreciated, if, if you have employees out here, could I suggest something that you thank them for their work? Yeah. That you just you know, frequently say, hey, appreciate what you did today. Yeah. Appreciate the work you did today. Yeah. Is that going to hurt you any? No. i tell you the last thing I think God likes is a haughty, cocky boss who thinks he's a hot rod and who thinks everybody else is under, under him and under his feet. I don't like that and I don't think God likes it. Now, he says, whatsoever you do, do it hardly as to the Lord and not unto men. Here again is this principle. Raise your level. Raise your, high, raise your sights. You're working for God. I'm doing this as unto the Lord. So I'm going to give it my best. I'm going to put my heart into it. I want to be, I want to be a blessing to these people. I want to be a blessing to the workers around me. I want to be, now, there's a difference between Men pleasing and working as the Lord. If you're trying to do your best to get buddied up to the boss and get maybe a promotion or a raise because you're men pleasing, that's a whole nother world. This ain't what the, the, God's talking about working unto him, irregardless of whether they appreciate what you did or not. Irregardless of whether anybody the other workers like it or not. Brother... Um, Bill Akins uh, uh, sold this story at different times, and, and I never, it's just always stayed with me. He went to work for John Deere up in um, Iowa. What's that town that had the big John Deere plant? Waterloo, Iowa. And he said, Reggie, I just was so thrilled because he said that was and has nearly, been, you know, like a really good place to work and, you know, good pay. And he says, I was excited. And he said, you know, I went in, wanted to work as unto the Lord. And so I just went about my work and. They put me in a certain station, told me this is what they wanted me to do every day. He said, I started doing it. He said, the second, I think it was the second or third day he was there. He said, one of the union bosses come by and picked him on the shore and said, hey, slow down. You shut down. You're trying to make everybody else look bad around here. Yeah. You got to watch things. Life's tough. Life's rough. Got a lot, a lot of wiggles and turns to it. Okay. His heart was to do it heartily as unto the Lord. He was thankful to God for the job. Want to do the best job I can in honor of the Lord. And that, I guarantee you that's Bill Aiken. I mean, that old boy's just got a pure... I mean, if anybody's got a pure heart, I figure old Bill Aiken does. You know? Bill, if you hear this, I'm... You know. But um, uh, he, he said there... For you serve the Lord God. He said, not unto men. Verse 24, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance... For ye serve the Lord Christ. If in my life, if all that I'm doing, I'm looking at I'm doing this for the Lord's sake and I'm doing this unto the Lord, it's going to change my whole attitude and my whole work ethic is going to change everything about what I'm doing. And, it's, and if I'm looking at it through the eternal lens instead of the temporal lens, it's going to make a lot of difference about my, how I feel about what I do. Now, so he gives it, but, but verse 25, but he that doeth wrong. Okay, who's going to do wrong? Everybody. You ain't going to go to some job place where everything's going to be just right. Bosses can do you wrong. Right. Employees can do you wrong. Right. But that's not the issue you need to take care of, necessarily. God says you're going to receive. The, who does wrong is going to receive for the wrong. And there's no respect to persons. doesn't matter who they are. God will bring everything into balance eventually. Now, he said in chapter 4, we're going to deal with masters given to your servants... That which is just and equal. And this is a big issue in America right now. Equal pay for equal work. Hmm. The Bible says right there, Masters, give unto your servants that which is just, two things, and equal. Yeah. Knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. You're going to give an account of how you've paid your employees. Right. And you need to be just in that, and you need to be equal in that. Hmm. But everything the world does, it flips it and reverses it and makes it. Because I'm going to tell you, all employees are not equal. All employees do not have the same value of their work. You can like that or lump that. If you hired me to come and fix your tractor tomorrow, and I fiddled with it for three weeks and didn't have it fixed, you want to pay me very much? And I tear up more than you had. It's worse shape when I got done. Why? Because I do not have the skills to work on tractors. I just don't. I probably should, but I don't. Now, I had a big old um, 
a generator, big old 480 generator, run a sawmill used to, and when I bought it, I thought it was going to run it, and got there and found out it was, a, what was it, Justin, or, or, or Jason, a, 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 two, a 480, it needed to be to, put to a 240. And I'm like, well, why don't, why'd they do that for? Now they got them where they got switches, you switch them over, right? But at that time, the guy told me, says, Reggie, that whole thing has to be rewired. I'm like, good grief. And I looked down there. <laughs> and then somebody said, call Jason Waltice. So I called Jason Waltice. He comes down and looks at it and says, yeah, I can do this. <laughs> and I'm not joking. I watched him do some of that and I thought, I, that don't look right to me. <laughs> I don't know if he's got the right wire or not. He's going to blow this thing up. <laughs> but you know what he did? He worked there a day or so. I don't know what well, Jason you remember. But I'm telling you, it was a nightmare changing that big generators, all that wiring. But there was a way you could wire it to make it 240, right? Somewhere. Something like that. <laughs> okay. I don't have a clue what he did. If it had been me, it would blowed up, burned up, exploded in the air. I don't know what it had done, but I don't have the skill. Don't call me to fix your generator. In fact, don't call me to fix nothing, okay? <laughs> I don't know how to fix nothing. <laughs> Don't even call me to stain your trim. It'll have splashes and splatches on it. This went where I didn't want it to go. <laughs> Just and equal. Just and equal. He's no respecter of persons. Now, we're talking about just and equal. I got some guys out there works for me. And they have different skill sets. Now, I'm just going to use my own personal experience. I got a man that can about fix anything that tears up on anything. And if he don't know, he'll figure it out. Can I tell you something? When you're running five or six pieces of equipment plus on wheels equipment, that person's worth something. Because do you realize how much money he has saved me by not having to haul equipment to a place and pay a $150 shop hour? And then have an employee that can run a, how many knows how to cut logs on a, on a, on a, on a, a sawmill? How many people in here know? I mean, you know how to do it. There's one, two, three, three people in, in three or four hundred people here tonight that knows. I know a little bit if I've got the computer working right. Somebody that knows how to throw a log on the, on the deck and can look at that log and says, I know how to get the maximum out of that log. I know what to do with it, how to cut it to get the greatest yield out of it. He's worth something. Okay, if you have computers or you have equipment, whatever it may be, skill sets matter. You don't want to pay me what you would want to pay somebody else that knows how to do something. That's why it's important that you learn skills. Apprenticeship should come back into this country. And if I was a young man right now, I guarantee I would do this if I was a young man now. I never even heard about apprenticeship until I was like 28, 30 years old. Started st studying the Bible and studying history. And I found out that young men used to go places and learn how to do different skill sets and different trades. And then usually they'd find out what they liked to do and what they were good at. And they would go for that in their life. If you get a chance to go work with an electrician, work with a plumber... Work with a construction worker, uh, uh, work on the farm, run a tractor. You know, there's a lot of boys growing up, they don't know where the clutch is. They don't know what a PTO is. They're dangerous on anything. You know, I mean, they need to learn how to operate stuff. And you say, well, I'll never use that. You don't know that you won't ever use that. You never know what you might really like to do and you might be good at if you just had some chances, opportunity to do that, okay? And so I'm saying this to you, your skills is going to determine what's just and equal for you. You say, Reg, I want you to pour me a wall, concrete wall. You don't want me doing that. I put a picture on one day, a Facebook, it was so funny. I found this picture and this wall was just going like this down through there and two of them, you know, and, and the caption was, I'm about ready to start, up, start building. And people commented on that. <laughs> it's like, you really did that? That's stupid. You can't build on that, you know. And you don't want me doing that because, first of all, I don't want to dig very deep. 
I don't even want to put a footing in for my wall. <laughs> See what I'm saying? You need people to know what they're doing. I don't know how to pour a wall right. I don't know how to do it. He said, well, Reggie, you could learn. Maybe I could, but it's a little late in life now. But I'm just saying this to you, that just and equal is not just, oh, okay. Now, watch this. So we're going to pay just and equal wages. So that means we're going to pay everybody the same wages. This is where, this is where your socialism is coming to now. This is where they're coming to. And they want you to have to pay somebody that don't have a clue what they ain't worth a nickel. They want to pay them. And that's what this socialistic crowd's after. And they don't want to have any accountability or responsibility to their work. Now, we could get into a lot of things like that. But anyway, uh, it, when you get into employer and employee relationships, there's, there's this basic thing that God has ordained. There's a common need for each other. An employee needs employ, uh, employer needs employees. We, God has designed marriage. We need each other. In church, we need each other. On jobs, we need each other. You know, I've got a pair of glasses on tonight. I have no clue how they make these things. Does anybody get a hearing aid? Huh? <laughs> I don't know who makes them things. Uh, one, one time I had a front tooth fall out. I've got a spacer in here. I'm glad there's people. I went to the dentist. He goes in there and mix, he just, you know, mixes up stuff, puts in, oh man, look, 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 got teeth. I'm glad somebody knows how to do that. I'm glad for all these different, I'm glad somebody figured out how to make glasses. I'd have to stand 15 feet to read my Bible. And people have their, I'm, I have a need you know, I'm going to be honest with you. When I woke up that morning and stepped out of the bed and I stepped my left foot and hit the floor and my foot was numb and my leg went crazy, I'm glad there's a doctor, I'm just going to be honest with you, who had somebody designed the MRI who could see in there what the trouble was and see all that junk that had gathered up in that hole where my nerve goes down. And I'm glad they had skills to do that because, to you know, be honest with you, I think I'm improving Christ. I'm glad when my arm went out on me, they was able to fix that. And they say, well, I don't, I, you know, fi fine, whatever. I'm glad for people that have skills. Yeah. By the way, if I was cutting on somebody, I'd want to get paid for it too. Right. You know, our babies, when they were born, the doctor, Karen had C-sections. And, and that doctor told me, that, I don't know whether it was Susanna or Sarah, one of the last ones, he told me that his insurance... At that time, this would be in the 90s, was 300 and some thousand a year back in the 90s. He said, Reggie, I know you think I charge a lot. Back then, it was about 6,000 bucks for seven, or 7,000 for a C-section. But I tell you, I'm glad people have skills. I'm thankful people have skills. I'm glad that somebody knows how to drive a truck that can bring our groceries to us. I'm glad somebody ain't out there, you know, that they know what they're doing. Equal pay. See, just and equal is according to, well, what kind of skills do you have? And what's that skill worth in a free society? Now, so we're going to, now we're going to talk about philosophy of economics for just a little bit here. And political theory, because this is all what this involved. Now here, you got all over the world, you got all these different theories and political philosophies about labor and employment and so forth. Venezuela has been under a socialistic government. They stole from their people. Yep. And, uh, and, and America is being encroached by socialism. And in our universities, our young people are being taught Dar uh, not only Darwinism, but Marxism and Leninism. Yep. And they're being pumped socialism into the heart of our country. Right. And that works its way into our political processes yep. and our platforms of our political parties. And it affects the way you live. Okay? Right now, one of the big issues you're talking about is inflation. Well, how in the world, what do you mean, what's inflation? And how's it get here? And how'd this wind up? I mean, does anybody know what gas was four years ago? Dollar seventy. What is it today? 309, something like that. All right, what happened in four years? Inflation. inflation. How, did it, how did inflation come? Government spending. Government spending. Government printing of money. money. The more they print money, the less the dollars you have are worth. 
If you had $100,000 in a saving somewhere, but you weren't getting enough to cover the inflationary value, within 10 years, your $100,000 would have lost all its buying power. Do you realize that? Now, who decides we're going to have inflation? Political people who want votes by people who, by and large, don't want to work. They have to pump money into the system to afford all the programs they voted in. So we're going to have more money. So where are you going to get it? You're going to, uh, if you raise taxes too high, the people's going to vote. So what do you do? You print, print more money. Yeah. <clears throat> that makes the people who are working dollars worth less. You took home $500 from your check. Four years ago, that $500 would buy yeah. <clears throat> what $750, $800 takes to buy now. So it's important to your life. This is real stuff, okay? You have Marxism, socialism, and in that there's no personal property. They do not believe in pr private ownership. <laughs> they believe the government should own all property and all businesses. Okay? That's a false, unbiblical belief system. The Bible said every man shall sit on, by his own vine. Let me show you about land ownership. Naboth had property that God had given him, and Ahab wanted it, offered to buy it. He said, I cannot sell it because God says I can't sell it. So he has it, him and his wife, Jezebel, has him killed to steal their land. That teaches you something. That land ownership, property ownership, is very valuable to a free people, and it is a biblical, approved of God concept for you to be able to own property. Amen. <clears throat> But communism, you're not to own nothing. You're to move into our motel. You're to move into your apartment, your government-owned apartment, and we'll take the rent out of your check. You don't even decide whether you how much you want to pay rent in your check. We take it out. All right? They believe, watch this, this is very important, that the state is more important than the individual. And that the individual must sacrifice his life to the good of the state. That's opposite the Bible. God says that you as an individual. God does not. God doesn't save nations. Governments. God saves people. Jesus didn't die for, for governments. He died for people. Alright. So you had this collectivism. Collectivism was started in Jamestown. The first, first local government in America. Was socialistic. It was a Jamestown. And they came in here, and they decided, we're going to go to Acts chapter 4, and we'll get there pretty soon. And we're going to all plant our gardens, and we're going to share and share alike. Mm. No, it didn't work. About all starved to death. Yeah. How come? Some of them said, well, ain't no use me going out there and holding my corn or planting my corn. I'll just eat out of his garden. Yeah. If you think social system doesn't work, hey, come on, come on buddy, you're so handy. I need about four other boys up here. Come on, four other boys about his age. You may get up here. Come on, there you go. All right. Now we're going to have we're going to be socialists. <laughs> All right. And so you guys are going to pick walnuts as a socialist collective farm. Okay. So, so y'all interested? <laughs> I don't think they're very interested. So here's what's going to happen. This boy here. He says, uh, what's the, and so what's going to happen is we're, we're going to all go pick walnuts. And then when we take the walnuts to sell them, we're all going to split the money evenly. Because we're socialists and we really believe in justice and equality. <laughs> equal pay for equal labor. Boy, that sounds good, don't it? <laughs> But this little rascal right now, I, I like the look on. He's got that mischievous look, and so, uh, so we're going to we're going we're going to go over here with him. And so you guys are out picking walnuts. You guys pick pick walnuts, guys. Would you pick walnuts here? We'll pick one. And so you pick some walnuts. Would you up picking walnuts? Back breaking work. How many that pick walnuts for a living? All right, all right. But but this, this not for a living, but for a little extra money. All right, and. Now this guy here, he says, uh, oh guys, I, I got to go use the bathroom, get me a drink water. I'll be back pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, you guys keep picking. And about four hours later, he comes back. Right? 
He comes back. Oh man, sacks are everywhere. Yeah, boy, he jumps in. Let's. <laughs> he nailed him. And so anyway, so boys, it's time to load them all up. So we're gonna load all the walnuts up, put them in the back of the pickup truck. Get in here, help, help, help. Everybody, get in there. Cook. Put them in the back of the truck. Take them down there. And I'm. I'm so here we go. Who do I pay here? <laughs> okay. So who do I pay? All three of them. Who do I pay? Started out. Oh, and but wait a minute. He's gonna come up here. He's gonna say. So I write him a check. Write him a check. Write him a check. Write him a check. That's socialism. When I was on the plane with Dean and Danny going to Russia, I sat by a man that was working for the American military who was going over for some kind of deal. And he was talking to me. And he said, and he'd been over a lot. He said, yeah. He said, he said yeah, they're nice people. And we visited. And he told me kind of some stuff. You know, I've never been to Russia before. He said, Reggie, they're a uh, very poor country except for their military power. And he said, other than that, it's just a thir- they're just a third world country. And he said, he said, if you want to know what really goes on, it's like this. He said, they got these huge collective farms. Government owns it all. And you, I want to work on a farm. So, oh, okay, you can work on a farm. And so I want to drive a, a, a pumpkin truck or a tomato, t- tomato truck. So I'm going to be the guy who pulls the truck down there. They load my truck up with tomatoes, and I head off to Moscow. But I have a flat on my truck with my tomatoes. There, he said, there's no incentive for me to call anybody. There's no incentive for me to be in any rush. Because I'm not going to make any more money if they get there or they don't. Wow. Now, hey, listen to me. This destroys incentive. Yes. Yes, it does. And he said, listen to this. He said, the funniest thing in the world is to hear a Russian brag that they live on two-thirds of what they produce. Wow. We lose a third of our crops nationally. But we live on, we can live on two thirds of it, and they're like proud of it. And the whole, in, what it's done to them inside is to say, why should I care? I'm not going to make any money for trying harder. I'm not going to make any more money for inventing anything or coming up with a better idea. Because he's going to get paid the same as you, even though he went over. And sit on his backside for three hours while you guys was doing walnuts. And you know what that creates? Not a really good feeling toward this guy. But if you're not careful. <laughs> but if you're not careful, you know what will happen? You'll say, next time, Bozo, I'm going to be the one that goes. And I'm going to get pay. Huh. Yeah. Now watch this. So now you got one, two guys out of four who have decided they're not going to do it. But we're going to get paid. So now you got these two working harder. And now they're having to split it. And you know what? By that time, he says, I'm out, man. I'm going to go sit on my backside too. But when it comes to pay time, I want to be just like these guys. You gave it to them. You're giving it to me. This is communism, socialism, 101. You've been to college. And this is how it happens. Now, whenever they opened up in Glasnost in Russia, and pe- Perestroika and all that, here's what happened. Danny and Connie all probably saw this. And they give people a chance to operate what's called, what they used to say they hated, free enterprise capitalism. Uh-huh. And people are being taught to hate that in America now. Yeah. Yeah. But let me just tell you something. Free enterprise capitalism is when you've got the nice shoes you've got on and the nice clothes. Yeah. Now, we're going to get into something here in a little bit. It's not going to be funny. But here's what I'm going to tell you this much. It makes for the most goods at the best, the best and most amount of goods at the best prices competitively. Yes, it does. You can, this is, that's an absolute solid truth. And so when they loosened all this socialistic stuff over there, this guy says, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to order from some country some uh, uh, pencils and erasers and uh, shoelaces. And they'd set up little 10 by 10 tents. And they'd have goods that they had bought and had shipped in, and they sold them on the right of ways. There were hundreds of 10 by 10 tents set up, free enterprise, 
trying to buy something and resell it. Or they would decide, you know what? I'm going to start my own concrete company. I'm not doing this junk no more. I think I can do better by having a con- you know, pouring concrete and doing concrete. He comes over and says, you know, I think I can do better by ha- setting up my own garage and my mechanic and I, before I can work on the tractors and so forth. And I can do better. So all of a sudden, these guys, they hate, those people hate socialism. We're trying to embrace socialism. And they make it sound, they're so religious. Now, you guys can be seated. Thank you, guys. You did a great job. Appreciate it. <clears throat> All right, now, let's go to Luke chapter 10. I want to show you something in the Bible a lot of people don't want to get. Luke chapter 10. Guys, put this up if you don't care. And uh, this, is, this is wild. This blows, this blows people out of the water. How many, <laughs> I'm going to be a little on here now. How many people have ever been on a job and you found out somebody else getting paid more than you are and you felt like you were doing just as much work and it ticked you off? Let's go to Luke chapter 10. Oh my goodness. I ain't got the right reference. My goodness sakes alive. What did I do? Can anybody please help me? I'm looking for the passage of scripture where the guy hired him, the, the laborers. Could somebody help me? Maybe it was, was that Matthew chapter 10? I don't, can't believe I wrote that down. That's No, that's not right. I've got Luke 10, 1 through 16. I looked it up this evening whenever I was before. Matthew 20. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. I was just off 10 chapters. Oh, thank you. Matthew chapter 20. Ah, he makes me tired. His brain works like a... <laughs> I guarantee he pulled that out of his head. He, you didn't? Oh! <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> Moral of that story, if you're dumb, marry a smart woman. Amen. <laughs> smart women make you look good. All right, chapter 20, Matthew. Now, what's your right? For the kingdom of heaven, heaven is like a man, to man that an household which went out early in the morning to hire laborers in his vineyard. He's got this vineyard. And he's to be harvested and worked in. He's going to hire guys. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said unto them, Go ye also in the vineyard. Now watch this. And whatsoever is right, Amen. I will give you. Amen. And they went their way. And again he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, I mean harvest is on. Man, they got, you know. He went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? And they say, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also in the vineyard. And here it is again. Whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. Now, all these guys said, I'm all in. I'm going. I agree to that. So when evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came there, came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Now, just to be truthful with you, you read this and you go, hmm. Do you hang on here. And when they were hired, verse 9, about the 11th hour, they received every man a penny. And when the first came, those that early in the morning, they supposed, they supposed, they supposed, assuming and supposing will get you in trouble. That they should have received more, more than they agreed on back there in verse 2. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, what did they do? They murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made made them equal unto us. So now, all of a sudden, what is just and equal? That's why you need to be careful about what you say you'll do. The Bible said, he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. 
You see, the situation changed after they'd made the agreement. What's God saying? Stay by your word, do what you said you would do, but be careful what you say you'll do. But boy, good. Thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. And he answered one of them, now this is, this is powerful now, and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Remember what it says in Colossians? He that doeth wrong shall receive. The Lord of the deal said, I have not done you wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Now, if we're not careful, we're kind of, I want to just be honest with you. Reg Kelly kind of backs up and goes, man, I don't know. Boy, that's, I mean, why didn't he tell me to give him, you know, a quarter of a pence? But the pressure was on to get the job done. And But here's the great secret to it. And if you're not careful, you'll find out you're a socialist right here and you won't even know it. Verse 14, take that is thine, go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Look at verse 15. Is it not lawful for me to do with what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? Who didn't stay by their word? Who did not stay by their word? It wasn't the Lord of the vineyard. It was the guys who agreed to do something. And then when they saw, watch this, this is how Marxism works. This is why communism has worked. They play on the discontent and jealousy and envy of people against each other. And they say, look over there. They've got a better car than you and they don't deserve that. And if you lived under communism, you'd all drive little green and gray cars. <laughs> Wouldn't be no shiny red pickups. Yeah. Go to Russia, you'll find out. Yeah. Everybody's passing you, but it's in a little green or gray car. They've only got two colors that I think I've ever seen over there. I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm colorblind. Yeah. You see, they, we don't want to be jealous of each other. It will cause no envy because, you know, no, nobody drive a nice rig. Everybody's going to be equal. And it's a and to them, you know, it's, weird, it's kind of strange. They're atheist. Communism is atheistic by its nature, yep. but they think it's a sin for you to have anything more than anybody else. Yeah. Yeah. They make themselves humanistic gods, and they I determine which, what's right and wrong. And I'm going to tell you tonight: if you and I did not have this book to tell us what's right and wrong, we wouldn't have a clue either. But when you throw that book out, you'll start using human reasoning, and what it does. Is drives nations into extract poverty. Yeah, that's right. Go to, I, I don't go there right now. This is an age-old issue. There's a guy named Jacob. He saw a lady, but a young lady by the name of Rachel. Inquired about her. Yeah, you can have her for seven years of work. Jacob said, deal. The Bible said he worked for her seven years. And it's just like, what? Just, that's nothing almost. Comes wedding time. <laughs> he slips Leah in on him. I've always wondered how this all happened. But I, that's, I'll leave that to God. And he comes up next morning and says, you tricked me, Laban. I work for Rachel, not Leah. Ah, he says... You know, have a week here and you can have her. But then, what was it? Another seven years. The, he, 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 he was rooking him. Yeah. But Jacob went ahead and did it. Okay, now, you go, after that, you get into this deal where, down the road, Laban is just really tickled with Jacob because he's kind of made him rich in the cattle business. Yeah. He's real good at that stuff. There's some really interesting things going on there. But it, you get up in the chapter of 42, I believe it is, and, and Jacob says, you know, I did this and I did this. You changed my wages six times, ten times? This is an old issue. This, is, this has been going on forever. The only way you'll ever be right about it is be scriptural, be meek, be loving your neighbor. Think about him and his concerns. Can I tell you something? An employee needs to very, be very aware of the spirit and attitude and countenance of his employees. 
Because they may have just been told by their wife or something, I'm leaving. Or they may have just been told your child has cancer. They may have been all kinds of things. You do not know what's going on at their house. They need to come to a place to work where they can be appreciated and loved and encouraged and where there's openness to the troubles and sorrows and griefs of life. And if we're going to be Christian people, we need to treat employees with respect. Respect. They're not dirt under your feet. You're not a hot rod because you hire people. Well, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 13 says, and this issue of that you're to pay them every day. In other words, here's the issue. And I wonder about this sometimes because we usually like go a week now or two weeks, something like that. But in the Bible, you were to pay that employee every day. The sun, you don't let the sun go down. You pay him. What was that all about? You don't let pay build up. You keep that man paid. He needs his money to pay his bills, to buy his groceries, to, to pay his bills. You don't say, well, I'll, we're going to just put this off for two weeks. We ain't going to pay you for a while. And that kind of junk. When you get into Ruth chapter 1, Boaz had reapers in the field. This is a wonderful, beautiful thing. You say, the blessings of the Lord be upon you. He comes down by his... I mean, you're talking about a good place to work. Boaz tells his workers in the field, the blessings of the Lord be upon you. Bless, bless the Lord. Yeah. I mean, he was blessing... He literally was giving God's blessings to the people that were working for him. How many would not be bad to work in a place like that? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Jeremiah 22.13. Put that up, guys, if you don't care. Jeremiah 22.13. Watch this. One of the problems that Israel was having before their captivity was the way they were treating employees. Jeremiah 22, verse 13. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. And his chambers by wrong that useth, watch this, his neighbor's service without wages and giveth him not for his work. Hmm. Haggai 1 6, guys, you're going to put Haggai 1 6 up. I'll just let you chase it tonight, all right? Haggai 1 6. And we'll look at that in three or four of the passages of Scripture here and then we'll let you out. Haggai 1 6. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough to drink. Not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a bag with holes. This is talking about the guy that's working. You know, God says you can, you can have such an attitude in your life and so forth going on that the money, you're, it's not your employee's fault, your employer's fault all the time. It may be that you're not living for God and taking care of your money and doing right. You know, there's, there's, there's personal responsibility about, go to Malachi chapter 3, verse 5. Malachi 3, 5. I will come near to you in judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers, false swears, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages. What does it mean to oppress the hireling in his wages? You're not paying him a just wage. Now listen to me. This is dicey. You talk about minimum wage. I, I'm not a big fan of minimum wage. Because if you impose, if the government imposes minimum wage on a business, that business has no choice but to raise prices, and there comes your inflation. Exactly. Right. right now in California, they put in a bit. What was it? Twenty twenty dollar minimum wage, and there's uh, fast food outfits that are just sold out. They're moving out of state. Yeah. yeah. Can't afford it. Or they're telling their waitresses and waiters, "You're going to live on your. You're going to live on uh, what do you call it, tips." Because we can't afford to pay you. The government ha tells us we have to pay you that much. <clears throat> now we're going to get into something here. And I'll address this. Everybody likes for things to be reasonable and, and, and you know, not cost too much. We've got a situation going on in this country. Yeah. We say that we want to pay people. This, this bothers me. We say we want to pay people just wages and pay people right, and even in, to the extent that we would impose minimum wages. But it doesn't bother us to buy tennis shoes made in China under yeah. communist oppression. Uh -oh. yeah. Amen. It doesn't bother us to buy equipment that's been made by people that virtually are nothing but communist country yeah. slaves. So we're not really so hot rod on wages. It just depends on who it is.
go to Walmart, you tell me where everything's made in Walmart. I just be honest with you, I don't know if I bought anything in the last six months made in America. I was looking at a uh, piece of equipment the other day, got to stay it out, it says assembled in Mexico. Oh, we all want, you know, just and equal wages up here, but it really doesn't bother us to get a cheaper car or a cheaper this or a cheaper that. It's if it's on somebody else's sweat back. Or maybe even slave labor. Maybe even child. Sl- I mean, I'm going to tell you some of these basketball stars making millions off of tennis shoes and T-shirts that were made in Bangladesh or somewhere off of some 13-year-old slave. Don't talk to me about your justness of oh, your righteous justice. You ordered them things made. You had them shoes ordered over there, that country, a bunch of slaves. Would you talk to me about being just and equal? You're a hypocrite. Amen. There's a lot gets into this. And let me tell you another thing. I'm not against the general principle of united voice because employers in American history, there's been what I'm against monopoly. I do not think anybody should be able to have a monopoly. Here's what, let me give you this. What if you wanted to start a, a hardware store, but there's a monopoly? You can't. They'll price you out of business. They'll just lower everything, drive you out of business. There's a reason that our government protects against monopolization of industries and business, because people can get so much money and so much power, they can keep everybody else out of business. And it is not a level playing field. But when you unite so much and force labor cost up, to where that labor cost has to be passed into the product yeah. that is a higher level of the pe- other people that are working in your pursuit of increased wages you've made it harder on other people yeah. so this issue of just and equal is very dicey because what may be just and equal for you may be a catastrophe for the next person yeah. Yeah. That's right. because usually we're only thinking about us yeah, that's right. and not other people. And that's just, just the honest truth. Now, I'm, I'm a strong believer that charity begins at home. How can America help other countries if we're not strong physically and financially ourselves? We can't do it. We need to stay strong ourselves. It's just like here at church it, it, or a family. If, if a church wants to help other people that are have the fire or whatever, if we're not in good shape ourselves financially, how can we help anybody? Right. So we need to be strong financially so that we can help. Same thing with your family. How can you help anybody if you're not strong and stable financially? All right? Charity, that's where you get the charity begins a home thing. Because you, So here's what I'm saying. <clears throat> when you cause, watch this, factories, business owners to either close their doors or move out of the country... Got an issue. You can say, ah, they ought not make that over there. But it was either that maybe or close our doors because we're being forced to pay wages that will not suffice of the buying power of the American people. A lot goes into this. It's not an easy subject, all right? Okay, Uh, go to Luke chapter 3, verse number 14. Luke 3, 14. And we'll try to wrap this up and try to be out here in just a little bit. Luke 3, 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accusing him falsely, and watch this, and be content with your wages. Now I'm going to throw you a curveball. Are you ready? I don't care what you're making an hour. If you're going to buy every meal at the window of McDonald's, there's not going to be a good enough job for you in this country. If every you're going to buy everything out here, and you're you know, you're just going to go here and, and do all that, there's not going to be a job good enough for you. Maybe it's not more money you need. Maybe it's better management of the money you're making. Amen. Now, I'm all for you getting a better job. I'm telling you right now, you ever seen a guy that likes to say, I'm telling you what tickles me to see people do good. But there also needs to be built into us disciplines and things to learn how to live. I'm telling you right now, you go, you go out and eat. 50 bucks is nothing. 50 bucks is nothing. By the way, my daddy used to say, Greece is a lot cheaper than parts. 
Let me tell you something about an employee. You may have an employee, he's not that sharp on some things, but he will grease the tractor, which saved you $15,000 repair bill. There's just a lot of things goes into what's just and, and what's equal. Now go to James chapter 5. Put that up. James chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. And uh, we'll go to now you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that should come upon you. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you. They shall eat your flesh with the word fire. You've heaped treasure together for the last days. Watch verse number 4. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields... Which of you, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Seboeth. Let me tell you, one of the reasons that you have uh, unions and organized labor in this country is because everything from coal mining to material garments at one time Americans were often and especially immigrant Americans were often abused because they just got over here they just got their citizenship and they had to have a job and they took advantage and a lot of people corporations and companies I'm, and don't go against corporations corporations is a good thing if it's handled right a lot of good done a lot of things done by the power of united people getting together and doing things but they abused people. And this is what God's talking about here. And I'm going to taste it right now. Don't you ever do this. Don't you ever have a guy come up. <clears throat> I'll just get, tell you the truth. I had a guy call me about two years ago. And, and he called me up and told me his name. And he said, Reg, I'm needing a job. Bad. He said, a man told me to call your son. Once he had employment, he said he didn't have anything. He told me to call you. Do you have any openings? And I was kind of like, yeah, I did. But I was kind of like, well, you know, who is this guy? And he, right off the bat, he told me, he said, I've been in prison 13 years. Just got out. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> and then he texts me and he said this. All I ask you is to give me a chance to prove myself. And I read that and I thought, what if I just got out of prison 13 years? What if I was needing to get a job somewhere and couldn't get one because I was a felon? I texted him back. I said, be here in the morning, but this is trial basis only. He's still working for me today. Amen. <laughs> Do me and him have problems? Yeah. yeah. But I love him. Amen. He's been a blessing to me, a hard worker. He's had his troubles, still has his troubles. But you know, I'm glad people didn't give up on me when I had lots of troubles. Come on. There you go. And... Uh, I could have come in there. And in fact, I'm going to tell you all a little something going on. It's kind of bad. It's just, well, you can all go out there and stay if you want to. There's a deal going on in this country where they're giving guys, and I, I think some of this is okay, some of it ain't. Guys that would be in jail, they're letting them out to go work, but they're letting people hire them for almost nothing. Yes, sir. That's true. Be careful about that. I know, I know a guy who brags about how cheap he's getting these guys. Now, I'm all for, I think it's wonderful that they let them out to go work. Yeah. I think that's good. Yeah. As long as they behave themselves and do right. But if something kind of says in my spirit, watch out about that. Yeah. And I've been hearing a lot of rumble across our country about this. Yeah. If I were you and you hire them, I'd pay them according to their skills and ability, their attitude, just like you would anybody else. Because they'll pick up on it real quick that you're taking advantage of them. And they'll wind up despising you, and it's not a good testimony to the Lord. And that's just my two cents worth. That's not in the Bible, okay? That's, that's Reggie's two cents worth. Last scripture we're going to look at right here it is. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. Acts chapter 4, verse 3. Here's one of the reasons. This is a big subject. And uh, here the multitude of them that believe. Now this is the church getting launched out. Acts chapter 2, church is launched. Whole new entity, whole new deal. Multitude of them that believed were one heart and one soul. Well, that sounded good. Neither said any of them that ought of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. Whoa! Did you know this vast scripture has been used for socialism? 
by people who aren't even saved, they'll use this. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands, <laughs> I'm not this good a Christian, were possessors of how lands, sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, distribution was made unto them according as every man had need. What are you going to do with that? There are religions and denominations that have taken, there are preachers that have taken this and started little cults. And you all go sell everything you own and bring it up here and we're going to, and I'll put, I'll, you'll have a house. Did you know there's people, some people like this? Because they think this makes security for them. And uh, people say, well, that's in the Bible. Yeah, it is. Guess what happened in chapter 5? Next, I mean, just write a few verses down. A couple come in there, sold their place. Oh, we're going to bring it into the apostles and lay it at the apostles' feet. It lying like a dog. Yep. And they, Peter said to them, "Drop dead." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you never hear about it again. The rest of Scripture and the rest of the epistles teach you to go work yourself, provide for your own family. He that provideth not for his own is worse than an infidel. Do not use that scripture as a promotion of socialism. And people have tried it and tried it and tried it again and again. And Jamestown tried it. And they about starved to death. Because it's just like them four boys up here. Got to where most of them wouldn't, wouldn't put a hole in their hand. They was waiting for the rest of them to plant their corn and harvest it. And they come over for supper. Let's, let's stand. A lot of things come into effect on this. Pride, contempt, laziness, jealousy, theft, monopoly, labor force, profit. <laughs> I want to ask you all some question. How much profit is too much profit for you and your business? <laughs> when does it become excessive? <laughs> you didn't ever got there yet. I ain't either, amen. Just be honest, amen. The only people that think somebody's profit is excessive is the people that didn't make it. Right. That's right. That's a fact. <laughs> oh, good grief. And then nobody likes to talk about the guy that threw it all on the table and went broke. He tried. I can tell you story after story of America. Men who went broke. But started again. J.C. Penney. Colonel Sanders. You know. Don't sit around the house griping at people who are out there trying to do something. Get off your backside. Come up with an idea. And do something. Amen. And be glad for other people to be successful. It's not going to hurt you. Anyway. Free enterprise is not a sin. I am thankful. Listen, I'm going to give you a little illustration of where we're headed. When my oldest brother started his construction business, he started with a John Deere 420 tractor of my dad's and put a three-point reel on the back of it. Didn't have nothing. Went out to Kansas and did his first job. Nowadays, nobody, because of socialism and government intrusion... You couldn't go on that job without having three million dollars worth of insurance. So you couldn't even start. When I started auctioneering, I just started. I didn't have a license. But there are people, and I don't know how it is nowadays, I did it for 47 years and I'm thankful that I had a chance. But there are people who would like to start, they can't start because they don't get the licensing and the qualified education. If, and if, and if the big boys in the in legislature had their chant, their their way about it, it's like a real estate agent right now. If you ain't careful, you got to go through 42 hoops just to be a real estate agent, and on and on and on it goes. Yeah. But here's the thing: the bureaucracies want to keep you paying them to tell you how to do your business. 
you know, God's not against government. He ordained government. But government needs to keep in balance with freedom of the people. Lord, we pray tonight that we've not said anything to hurt anybody or be displeasing to you especially. Or be wrong. Or imply the wrong thing. But God, we need help. And Lord, from the scripture. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to love. That's the bottom of everything. If we love people, we won't want to cheat them out of their wages. We won't, wouldn't want to cheat those that we work for. So, Lord, help us to work as unto you and not unto men. Help us, Lord, to work uh, without eye service, not as men pleasers. And, Lord, help us to be hardly, put our heart in what we're doing. Lord, I thank you for letting me be born in this nation where I, there's so much opportunity. And, Lord, I tell you, I pray that you'd help us to uh, bring forth into the culture biblical principles of business, labor, wages. And, uh, Lord, help us. To do what our forefathers did. To uh, inculcate these biblical principles into our governments. And Lord we pray now for these families and these homes. I pray you bless them as they go out this week. Protect them. Keep them safe. And Lord I pray that you would bless them. Lord whether they work for somebody or whether they employ somebody. God help us to treat them like we'd like to be treated. Help us to operate out of love. And of reverence and honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it a lot.